What is social media doing to me? What is it doing to my peers? That was only four days, and it was anxiety-inducing. It was stressful, and it resulted in withdrawals. You know, Facebook's supposed to make you feel connected, happy, but there is a fascinating new study that has uncovered rampant envy. People look like they have a much better life than they really do. It follows you everywhere now and it follows you in your bedroom, and then you get into your bed at the end of the night, and you have a choice between all of the information in the history of the world or the back of your eyelid. Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. Is there nothing left that we can't not feel insecure about? Um, and what we found was that the number one value um, in those shows out of a list of 16 values was fame. Suicide rates being up, they know someone that their kids go to school with, depression, anxiety, what's causing that? We're being fed this constant barrage of unrealistic expectations. Just because you spend your entire life in a bathing suit taking Instagram selfies on a rock suspended 4,000 feet above a ravine doesn't mean I can't enjoy some Friends reruns on Netflix wrapped in an Ugg blanket with a sleeve of Thin Mints at my side. You want all these people that ain't even there to be seeing your, your photo. Grilled cheese, you, right. just, you want the validation. Like me, like me, like me, like me. I don't like me. Like me, like me. <laughs> Have you ever had a pain in your neck? You get that real sore neck and you have to be talking to somebody and they're sitting next to you and they ask you a question, you're like, oh, and you realize, ah, I forgot. You gotta kind of turn your whole body. It's, it's the worst. Maybe you get a pain in your neck. Well, you fall asleep at, you know, in front of the TV and your head's kind of at a weird angle and you wake up and you're like, oh, great, I'm gonna have this for a couple days. And it's no fun at all, right? Or you, or, or, or you fall asleep in bed with a tablet in front of you, you're reading and you wake up with drool on your tablet and your neck all kinked over and you're like, oh, your day starts. You know, pain in the neck is, is a pain in the neck, you know? And, and coveting, which we're going to talk about today, a word that you may not have even heard before, it isn't used very often, coveting really gives you a pain in the neck. You know what coveting is? It's living your life, instead of looking at what God's given you and what you have, you spend all your time doing this. What well, she got? She got, what? She got that? What did I, I wish I had what, I wish, what he, he, he doesn't deserve that. Oh, I, I want one of those. You know? Her wife, I mean, I mean his, his, uh, uh, her husband, I'd, I'd rather have a husband like that. You know, his wife, I'd rather have a wife like that. We, we're spending time looking around comparing. I wish I had their job. I wish I had their abilities. I wish I had their resources. I wish I had their car. I wish I had their complexion. Whatever it is. Coveting is spending your time looking at what everyone else has, and eventually you get a massive pain in the neck. And not just a pain in the neck, a pain in the heart, a pain in your life. Because you're spending all your time coveting, wanting what other people have. Coveting is such a big deal that God put it in the Ten Commandments. It's nothing new. You sit there on social media, all the challenges of social media. It's nothing new. Coveting's been around for a long time. And so when God is speaking to his people in the ancient world, in the book of Exodus, and if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. It'll be on the screen as well. If you have a tablet or a phone, you can open up to Exodus 20 and your Bible app there. And it's interesting, we've gone through, a, there's a, you'll have read through a number of the Ten Commandments that are quite short. No murder. Don't commit adultery. It's a cup, two or three words. Don't do this, don't do that. But now in coveting, it digs a little bit deeper. And I think it's because God's trying to get our attention because most of us will look and say, well, this isn't a problem for me. I don't need to worry about coveting. I'm pretty happy with my life, with what I have. I'm not spending all my time looking at what other people have. But, but hear what God says to his people all through history. And remember that all of the Ten Commandments, God has given not to put us in bondage, but to set us free. If we'll follow the Ten, ten Commandments, they actually give us great freedom in life. So Exodus 20, 17 says this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. God, I wish I had a house like that. Oh, their house is so nice. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Oh, I wish I had a wife like that. <laughs> oh, I wish I had a husband like that. You shall not covet your neighbor's male or female servant, those who work for them, his ox or his donkey, his riding lawnmower, you know, their, their, their tractor. I, you know, the, here's the point. Here's the point. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or, what's the key word? Anything. What's the key word? Anything that belongs to your neighbor. God says, this is a big deal. 
Don't covet, don't spend your time getting a neck ache by looking at somebody else's life. Oh, they got, oh, their life is perfect. Oh, they have the best vacations. Oh, look at that. And yeah, don't swipe, swipe, swipe. You're like, oh, well, I wish I had. Oh, that would be great. I don't have that. My, my life stinks. I'm horrible. They're amazing. We just sort of crumple into a ball on the ground because we're just swipe, 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 overload with everyone's amazing life. And, and the Bible says, don't spend your time coveting, wanting, desiring, seeking after what belongs to other people. And I would suggest it's never been easier to covet. In the history of the world, it's never been easier to covet. Because now we have apps and we have things on our phone and on our tablets that present the world to us. And here's what happens. We start coveting, desiring the lives of other people when they don't even have the lives of other people. You following me? I wish I had a life like them and their life isn't like you think it is. So, so think about it, how people will present themselves and maybe we ourselves can be a little bit, get caught up into this. You know, if, if you're gonna share a picture of your family, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna say, look, look at here, here's my family, here we are. And, and notice, 1,508 likes, doing pretty good, man. That's how we roll right there. What people don't know is that took seven hours to get that picture. <laughs> the, the, little boy, the, you know, the, 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 the little girl there on the right cried for two hours and had to take a nap, and then they did three clothing changes. They airbrushed it, used a couple filters, and finally said, okay, now, now here's our family. And, and everybody goes, oh, I don't have a family that nice. Guess what? Neither do they. <laughs> and nobody, nobody posts this picture. Well, apparently somebody did. Um, one like, you know. Um, we don't post the picture of us in the middle of a fight with our kids, you know, just living through our tensions. You know, that's not what we, that's not what we want to present to the world. Or, or, or we, we get a chance to travel. Travel's a big thing to kind of let the world know how we travel. So, so we say, here, here's, here's us. I mean, this is how we roll. I mean, this is every moment. Smiles on our faces. Look at that squinky, winky little left there. Peace, baby. Um, it's just, you know, this, this, is, this, is our, this is our life. Nobody, like, when they run out of gas, get a flat tire, can't, and they end up, you know, camping out here for a day. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not posting, look at, our, look at us. You know, wow, what an experience we had, right? It's, it's. And we start looking at the best moment of someone's life and saying, I want, not only do I want their life, I want their life that isn't really their life. Or our homes, we like to kind of, you know, what's your home look like? You know, our, our, we got our kitchen done. We want to share with the world. It's beautiful. Look at that, just, you know, wonderful. And, and we don't, like, after a dinner with, you know, three, you know, some, some neighbors, three or four neighbors, and, and we're, it's midnight, and we can't work anymore. We say, I'm just going to call, <laughs> I'm calling it a night. The food will bake on the plates. I'll clean it in the morning. Now, let me share a picture with my friends and family and the whole world, right? Um, we don't, we don't present ourselves that way. We present ourselves, and, and, and all, all that to say, and I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing your life with other people, but all that to say, oftentimes we start looking at other people's lives and we want what they have. And the Bible has a, a word for that. Here's how God puts it. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, and the key is, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't spend your time coveting. So maybe you say, okay, it's a new word for me, a new concept. So, so here's the question. What is coveting? When we talk about coveting, when God says don't do it, let's be clear what we're talking about. So first, let's clarify what it's not. Coveting is not desiring normal things in life. There's nothing wrong with desiring things. If somebody says, somebody says I, I, I really wish I had a great job, and I long for that. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is when I want your job, Right? There's nothing wrong with a young person, a young woman. You know, she, she says, boy, I, I would love to meet a great young guy who's kind and who's generous, who's, who loves Jesus, and I, and I have a longing for that. That's not coveting. That's a, that's a good, godly longing. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about longing for the good gifts that God loves to give his children. But, but coveting is something very, very different. Coveting is desiring what belongs to someone else. When I want what someone else has, when I want what God gave to someone else, that's what coveting is. I want their job. I want their, I want their abilities. I want their car. I want their spiritual gifts. Oh, I wish I could sing like her. I don't have a voice like that. And we start longing for what somebody else has. Whatever, you fill in the blank. When we start to look at someone else and say, I want what they have, the Bible says, be careful. What is coveting? It's desiring what is not meant for me. There's some things that aren't meant for me or maybe not meant for me now or maybe not meant for me forever. 
But, but it, coveting is wanting what's not meant for me, but God has for somebody else and getting all wrapped up in that. What is covering? What is coveting? Coveting is desiring things, people, status, or experiences more than I desire God. And that's the real problem. When we start to covet, we want that experience. We want that relationship. We want that material thing. We want that standard of living. And we want it so much that it becomes the focal point of our life. And now we're going back to the very beginning of the Ten Commandments where God talks about idols and and loving loving only the Lord your God. When all of a sudden the pursuit of this thing or wanting this particular lifestyle or wanting this experience, that becomes more important, so important it becomes the focal point of my life and God moves below that. The biblical word for that is idolatry. Where stuff or things or experiences become more important than God. And and so, so God is deeply concerned about coveting so much that in the Ten Commandments he makes it clear and, and, and God wants us to understand it. And I think our problem in our culture is coveting is so common, we don't think there's anything wrong with it. We, we don't understand that the poison and the danger of spending our time fixing our eyes on other people's lives and other people's things and what it does to our soul and what it does to our heart, what it does to our view of others. And so we swipe and look and swipe and look and swipe and look and we look around and want and long and think about and, and, and ponder, oh, if only, if only I had that relationship, that opportunity, that thing, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be peaceful and content. And God says, this is a big deal. And honestly, as I looked at this one of the Ten Commandments, and I've shared a couple times in this series, there's some of the commandments I kind of look at and thought, well, that's not really a challenge for me, but I'm excited to preach about it. And the more I dug into the scriptures and what it really says, I realized, man, this is a challenge for me. I think this is a challenge for all of us. And I think our culture kind of lifts it up. It's just, just the way, the normal way of living, but it's dangerous, and God wants us to know that. So, coveting is a serious and dangerous sin, and we have to see it that way. We have to understand that coveting is a serious and dangerous sin. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans. And keep your finger there because we're going to be back in Romans in just a moment. But in Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul, in chapter 1, he gives this picture. And if you read the whole chapter 1 of Romans, the Apostle Paul is sort of giving this picture of the human condition of rebellion and sin and how we're kind of spiraling downward. And it says, you know, we got involved in these you know, as human beings in this kind of sin and this kind of sin. And it says, God just, at that point, God just said, okay, if that's where you want to go, God, God gave them over to their sinful ways. And they kept going, kind of spiraling downward and downward. And in this downward spiral, deeper and deeper into sin, we find this verse, verse 29 of Romans chapter one. It's in this whole series of things that God is just watching people spiral downward. And he loves us and he cares about us, but we choose to rebel against him. And we find ourselves in these places. And in verse 29, it says, they have become filled with every kind of Wickedness and evil and greed. That word greed is covetousness, wanting what's not ours. Wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. It just kind of keeps cycling downward. But in the midst of malice and murder and strife and evil and wickedness is covetousness. Greed. I want what you have. And I won't be happy till I get it. And maybe I won't be happy until you don't have it. And you say, I, I, my heart's not like that. Well, you need to be careful because, because God is saying, I want you to take this very seriously. And if you go, oh, it's, I, it's not a big deal. I, I mean, I spend a lot of time wanting what other people have, but it's not really affecting my life. God says, be careful, it does. Coveting is a serious and dangerous sin. Keep your finger in Romans, but then turn over to James chapter four. And if you have your, if your phone or if you use a tablet, just you know, pop in your Bible app there. James chapter four, verses two and three. And, and here God is giving this picture of how coveting, how, how wanting what isn't ours, how costly it can be, and how it can propel us into all kinds of behaviors that are dangerous and unhealthy. So we read this in James chapter four, beginning in verse two. You desire and do not have, so you kill. You covet, but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask You do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That's what James is saying. He's he's saying, being careful. You know, coveting, wanting what's not yours can lead to murder, quarreling, fighting. And and, and ultimately, it, it does something to our soul. All of a sudden, it's not just our neck that's sore from looking at everybody else's stuff. It's our heart that begins to ache and our soul that begins to break under the weight 
of constantly want, wanting what isn't ours and what God doesn't have for us, at least not for us right now. God wants us to know that coveting is a serious and dangerous sin. Back in Romans again, if you, if you have your finger in your Bible in Romans, go over to Romans 7. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, this great leader in the early church, is just honest and he says, he says I struggle with coveting. He, he's acknowledging his own struggle. His own longing at times for what other people have, what doesn't belong to him. And so in Romans 7, 8, we read this. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. He's hearkening back to, to Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments. <coughs> and he says, but sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. Paul says, when I realize what this, this problem is, this sin is, I realize, man, I am coveting what other people have. I'm wanting what they have. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Paul's acknowledging this is a big deal. I mean, this is why God put in the Ten Commandments. Because it's pervasive, it touches all of us. And because it's powerful, it's bigger than we think, than because it's poisonous. It corrupts our souls and our hearts and impacts our lives more than we know. And years ago, a great revivalist and, and preacher named Billy Sunday had a great quote, and I've, I've heard this years ago and I've, I've used it many times because I think it's just powerful and I, I think about it myself at times. He, Billy Sunday said this, one reason sin flourishes is that we treat it like a cream puff instead of like a rattlesnake. One reason that sin flourishes and grows is we treat it like it's a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake. If we understood the poison and the deadly nature of it, we'd be more careful. And that's the case with coveting. We don't recognize it as sin. It's just I spend lots of time looking at other people's lives wishing I had their life. And God says, man, I want you to live in freedom, and that's bondage. God says, I want to pour out my love on you, and that's not going to get it done. So here's a question. What does coveting do? If we're coveting, if we're spending time with our eyes, our hearts, longing for other people's lives and experiences and things and giftings and abilities, and if we're, if we're not thrilled about what we have, but we always want what other people have, we're never content, what does this do to us? And here's some of the things that coveting will do to us. It distracts our attention from what matters most. We can be so consumed with wanting this thing that we don't have that we miss all the good gifts we have, that we miss the people that God's put in our lives. That we miss the God who loves us, who wants to spend time with us. We're so busy pursuing those things others have that we need, we miss life and life in the full that God wants to give to us. It distracts our attention from what matters most. What does coveting do? It makes us unhappy. It really does. It makes us unhappy because, because we, we don't delight in what God has given. We resent what other people have. We don't celebrate what we have. We keep our eyes fixed on what other people have. What does coveting do? It grows discontent deep in our heart. Coveting causes us to be discontent. If this topic really strikes a nerve for you, I want to encourage you. There's a book called Satisfied by Jeff Mannion. Jeff preaches here about once a year. He's preaching here again soon. And Jeff is a great preacher. And he wrote this book called Satisfied, Discovering Contentment in a World of Consumption. And in this book, he tells a story that you've heard him, if you've heard him preach here, you've heard him share, it was years ago, but many of you probably weren't here, and I want to, I love this story because it just makes the point so clearly. He tells a story about a little boy whose parents give him a, a nice big scoop of chocolate ice cream after dinner, and he's just, he's delighting, and he's eating his chocolate ice cream, and he's just thrilled and so happy with this, and he just, it, the world is good. God's on the throne. There's peace in his heart. He's eating chocolate ice cream. He's got a wonderful scoop of chocolate ice cream. And it's perfect until his parents give his brother a bowl of chocolate ice cream. But his brother's bowl has two scoops, more than his. His brother's older. His brother's bigger. His brother finishes broccoli. You know? <laughs> um, but now, now the little boy, he can't keep his eyes on his scoop of ice cream. He can't even enjoy it. What's he doing? He's just looking. But why does he get, and he shouldn't. And, and, and as he whines and complains and fixates on his brother's two scoops, his melts. He doesn't even enjoy it. You say, well, that's so childish. Yeah, but we do that. 
right? We become discontent. We stop looking at what God has put in our bowl, in our lives. And we spend all our time looking at what other people have. And we miss the joy. We become discontent with what God has given to us. What does coveting do? It makes us resentful of what others have. It can go beyond just wanting what they have to resenting the fact that they have it. Why did she get kids like that? And I got, anyways. Uh, you know, what, you know, you know, why, did, why did he get the job? Why did he get the raise? Why does he have the car? Why, why do they have, you know, why is their life so easy? And all of a sudden we begin to resent people instead of delighting in the good gifts they have. We don't enjoy what we have and we can't even enjoy what they have. Now, what, a, what, a, what a poison in our souls that coveting is. What does coveting do? It kills thankfulness. It puts a stake in the heart of thankfulness. We stop saying, God, thank you for my scoop of ice cream. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my home. Thank you for my car. Thank you for whatever it is I have. Thank you for the abilities you've given to me. We stop being thankful because we're coveting what other people have and we want. What does coveting do? And it's a big deal to God. I want us to understand coveting is a big deal to God because God loves us and wants us to walk in freedom and coveting puts us in bondage. Ultimately, coveting grows the roots of idolatry deep in our heart. Coveting grows the roots of idolatry so all of a sudden we're so consumed with what we don't have that we so long for what we don't have that it becomes the most important thing and the all-consuming goal of our lives. And we have this thought that if I can just get that, then I'll be happy. If I could just have that experience, then I'll be happy. And what we don't know is that won't make us happy. That experience won't make us happy. That event won't make us happy. Because if we can't be content where we are now, we won't be content when we have that thing. It it becomes this, this carrot on a stick that we're striving for and we never attain. So how do I diagnose covetousness in my heart and life? How do I know if I'm struggling with this or maybe how much I'm struggling with this? And here's what I want to do. I want to invite you just to, just to quiet your heart for a minute. And if it would help you to, 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 to bow your head, to close your eyes, to think and reflect. And I want to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to each of our hearts. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that shoreline here in the worship center, online family worship, anywhere, I always have lots of people that are still fine, kind of figuring out who the Jesus is and on their way towards knowing about him. But even if you're not a Christian, I think that God, God wants to speak to your heart. And so I'm going to ask some questions. And you just quiet in your heart. Let God kind of nudge you and say, is is this you? These might be indicators to help you diagnose if covetousness, if coveting is in your heart and your life. Here's the first question. Will I step over or step on other people to get ahead? Are my actions, the things I do, are they stepping over or on people so I can get ahead and get what I want? Just let God speak to your heart. Here's the next question. Do I always seem to want more, bigger, newer, and better? Do I always seem to want more, bigger, newer, and better? If I do, maybe maybe coveting has taken over in my heart. Here's another question. Do I find myself complaining about what I don't have or what others do have? Out loud or in my heart? Do I find myself complaining about what others, what I don't have or what others do have? Am I slow to share and be generous? Am I slow to share and be generous? Is my neck sore because I'm always looking at what others have? Do I have a sore neck? Lord, all of us can be invited into this life of coveting and wanting what's not ours and and what we don't have. And we pray that as we think about the antidote to to coveting, as we think right now about what it means to to turn away from coveting, as we think about about what what it looks like to walk in a new way, speak to our hearts in these moments we have together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's the antidote? If you say, you know what, maybe in a little bit, medium bit or a lot, coveting is part of, and, and, and if you say, I don't, it's part of my life, I don't want it to be something that dominates me, that guides my life. I don't want to live that way. I want to hear this 10 commandment, apply it to my life and live differently. What's the antidote? How do I turn away from it? Well, here's some thoughts. First, 
grow in contentment with what I have. Learn to be content to say, God, I look at what you've given me right now where I am right now at this moment, and maybe someday I'll have that, that. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But right now, I'm okay. I'm okay right where I am. Because here's the truth. If I'm not content right now with what I have, I will not be content when I get something more. I won't. If I'm, if, if, I'm, if I'm not content now and I get more, I won't be content. If I'm not content and I have less, I won't be content. Here's the beauty of what God does in our hearts. If I'm truly content right now where I am, I say, God, I delight, I'm thankful. I, I, I'd love this or that. I'd love to take steps forward, but, but I'm truly content with what I have right now. You are truly content. Then when you have more, you'll still be content. And if you have less, you'll still be content because contentment is not based on how much stuff you have or having everything you want the way you want it. Contentment is knowing the presence and the love of God and his goodness in your life. Am I content with where I am now and what I have today? And ask yourself that question. I, I love this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. If we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. And this is a tough one. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. But can you say that? Can you say that? I made a promise to my wife before I married her. I made a promise to her. I said, Sherry, I promise you, we will never own a house. <laughs> we'll have a home. We'll have a, a home is where you live, but a house is a, you know. I said, I said, I promise you, we'll never have a house. I said, because we live in Southern California, I want to be a pastor Interest rates were like 12.9% on houses. There was, just not, there was nothing in our future that said we would ever own a house. And so I just wanted to be really clear with her. I said, I said if you want this, you're going to have to live without a house. I said, I, said, you know, I said, you don't get a house, but you get this. And you know, obviously, but, um, but, but, before, but before we got married, I, I, I said to her, is this true, honey? I said, I, said, I said, not this part, I mean the house part, right? But I, I, said, I, said, I just said to her, we'll never own a house. And you have to be good with that. And she said, I'm good with that. And then I said, we'll never buy furniture from a store. We'll only buy it from garage sales. And she said, I'm not good with that. And so, we nego so marriage is a negotiation, but that's a whole other sermon. But anyways, that, so, so when we got married, we, we lived in a little triplex in the front, front unit. The unit next to us was totally burned out and gutted. And next to that, on the other side, was, uh, was uh, another duplex that one was empty and one was a person. But it was just, we lived in a, in a rough area. But, but we, we had a place to live. We had a home. We didn't have a house, but we had a home. And can I tell you something about those years that we lived there? It was a rough neighborhood. It wasn't the you know, funnest place in the world to live. But we were so happy. And we were content. And we had each other. And it was wonderful. And then, and then with time... With time, we actually, I made enough money at the church I was serving to where we got to actually rent an apartment. And we got, and, and this guy, it was one of our favorite times, this guy George lived next to us, really sweet guy, and the apartment had like a community pool that you could swim in. It was like, man, we're a king, we're like, we're a king and a queen, man. We were, ha we were happy there. We were content there in the apartment. And then something happened. A church called me to Michigan, and the church owned their own house. It was called a parsonage. And the first time ever in our married life, we got to live in a house. And we had to like hang pictures on the walls and stuff. We're like, we just thought this, we didn't own it, but it was a home. And we were happy there. It was great. We were there for years. And then, the, then ended up in a different church, church I was at for 14 years. And they had just sold their parsonage and put the money aside. And they said, hey, listen, if you'd like to, we'll take the money from the parsonage and we'll help, we'll give you like a, like a, a no interest loan to help you get into a, your own house. And I broke my promise to my wife. <laughs> I promised her we'd never have a house. And God gave us a house. It wasn't super fancy, but it was our house. And I can stand here and tell you, and I know Sherry could too, the joy of our marriage and our love for each other and our walk for, with Jesus was just as beautiful and wonderful in that little triplex in the rough part of Pasadena as it was in the apartment, as it was in the parsonage, as it was in the house. We, we've got to say, God, thank you for what I have and where I am. To grow in contentment is one of the greatest antidotes to coveting. What is an antidote to coveting? There's more. To grow in contentment with what I have is part of it. To grow in my awareness of who has me. See, see getting over coveting and, and fighting it and, and growing content is understanding, being aware of who has me. 
I know what I have, but I know who has. I know I am held in the hands of the, of the living God of heaven. I am loved by Jesus Christ, his only son. I am filled with his Holy Spirit. And this one triune God, he has his hands on my life. I am in his hands. I may not have everything I want, but I know who has me. And that brings contentment. That brings peace. That brings joy. Whether you get more stuff or less stuff. And so to understand be aware of who has me, and then to look up more than I look around. I've got, I've got to look up more than I look around. I've got to stop doing this. What does she have? What do they have? What does he have? And more and more I do this. God, thank you for what I have. God, thank you. You've been good. And you've watched over me. And your love for me is enough. And your grace is enough. And instead, instead of spending all my time looking around, I look up. I'll give you a challenge. If you're, if you're in the world of social media, you spend a lot of time kind of swiping and looking and, and just, and just love, you know, oh, I wish I had that. No, they, they, and, you know, if you spend 15 minutes on Instagram or swipe, 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 looking, 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 then, then on your phone have a Bible app. If you don't know how to get a Bible app on your phone, just go by our connection center. They'll set you up. They're free and they're wonderful. And okay, 15 minutes swiping and looking at everybody else's wonderful lives and now I'm gonna open the Bible for 15 minutes and kind of cleanse the palate, cleanse the palate, cleanse the palate, right? So if you spend three hours swiping and looking and getting depressed, swiping, oh, look at their one, oh, look at that, they like, everybody likes them, everybody, you know, if you're doing three hours, then spend three hours in your Bible app. You say, well, I don't have enough time for that. Then spend less time swiping and looking and more time looking up and thanking God for his goodness. But just be careful where your eyes are. Look up and see God's goodness. How do we overcome coveting and growing contentment? Remember how the story ends. Say, do I remember how the story ends? See, I, I, I snuck ahead in my Bible. I read the end of the story. God wins, he's on the throne. There's a new heaven, there's a new earth. All tears are wiped away and we're with him forever. And some of the stuff that consumes us now, it, you, know, you, know, you know what matters eternally? The glory of God and being in his presence and being among God's people. And so we know how the story ends. When you start feeling discouraged, remember how the story ends. Read the end of the book and then make sure that Jesus is always enough. Make sure that you know that if you know Jesus, he's enough for you. And if you don't yet know Jesus, I can tell you, he's always enough. He always satisfies. If you really know him and if you really hold to him. And, and I love these words from John 6.35. It's Jesus speaking. We read in John 6.35, Jesus declared, I love this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. All that you long for, all that you hunger for, all that you thirst for in your deepest soul, in your deepest heart, it can be satisfied in Jesus. And you get that one right. And, and there's just a sense of, whew, okay, life's okay. I have Jesus, he has me, he satisfies me, he fills me. So, how does your life change when coveting dies, when covetousness dies, and when contentment grows? Our lives, if, if we can recognize this and call it, a, a, you know, call it a scorpion or a rattlesnake and not a cream puff and say, I'm not going to live my life always wanting what everybody else has. I'm going I'm to look to God. How can our life change? Here's one thing that's amazing. I have more joy for others. When you're not coveting what other people have, you can look at somebody else and you can say, oh, look what they got. They got that new job. They got that new car. They had that amazing experience. We can actually do this. Watch this now. We can go this and mean it. I'm so happy for her. I'm so happy for him. That's, man, we can look at somebody and say, man, that is so great. I'm so happy for you. We can celebrate other people's joys instead of looking at them going, oh, isn't that nice for you and your happy little life? You know, <laughs> everything works out for you, you know? We laugh because we've been there, right? <laughs> but say, but say I, I delight in what God's given me. I delight in what God's given you. We take delight in what I have. I celebrate with other stuff, and I look at what I have, and I say, God, you've been good. And you know what? My, my, my marriage isn't always easy and perfect, but I love my wife, or I love my husband. Boy, my kids are sometimes challenging, but God, you gave them to me, and I love my kids. I don't have the perfect house, but I got a place to live, and God, you've been good. I remember a woman who became a Christian here at Shoreline. She was homeless at the time. 
and eventually she was, then she was living in like a trailer, one of these trailers that just kind of barely runs and kind of, move, they kind of moves from place to place around Monterey here. And I remember at a time it got really rainy and she went out and she bought a bunch of these blue tarps because she had friends that were still living on the streets and when it rained, they'd get all soaking and wet. So she would actually set up little tents for them and she said, you know, I, I got, she told me, she says, Pastor, pray for me. I'm, I got this little ministry where I'm setting up these little tents for friends that are living on the streets because she says, you know, I got my trailer and this is a simple, her trailer you know, would barely run from place to place but she said, I got my trailer and she said, she said, I got it so good. She said, I got it so good. I want to help people that don't have it as good as me. Now, now, now her heart's changed. She now rents a room from somebody and has a job. She's not on the streets anymore. She's not in that kind of moving around mobile trailer, but she's now, and she's taking steps forward. But you know what? She was, she was walking with Jesus each step of the way. That's what God wants for us. That's what God celebrates. I celebrate who I have. My life changes because I celebrate who I have. I, I say, it's, I'm not spending all my time thinking about the stuff I want, but I think who I have. I have Jesus. I have his love. I have his grace. I have his friendship. I have him living in my heart and watching over me. I can celebrate Jesus. I'm amazed by who has me. I just spend my days delighted that there is a God who made the heavens and the earth and he loves me. And he left the glory of heaven to come to this world to die on a cross and take my sins and call me his daughter, call me his son. That's good news. That's amazing. And contentment and not coveting leads us to that condition of heart. And then ultimately my attention is more and more on Jesus. All of a sudden I'm not just spending all my time I'm not even going to spend all my time looking at what I got in my bowl. And I'm not even spending all my time looking at what somebody else has in their bowl. I'm looking at the one who's given me breath and life and strength and the ability to think and to act and to live. And the one who's with me even when it's hard. And my, my focal point, when I, when I really understand this, when I stop coveting, it's not just that I just keep an eye on what I have. I keep my eyes on who gave me all I have. And I say, Jesus, thank you. I worship you. I celebrate you. And Jesus, we do that today. We, we just pause right now to say, we don't want to spend our days and our hours and our lives looking at what everyone else has. We want to just pause and take a deep breath and say, Lord, wherever I am in this journey of life, the love you've given me in Jesus, the things you provided for me are good gifts. Help us be thankful and content and joyful right where we are so that, God, if you choose to give us more, we'll still be thankful and joyful and content. And, Lord, if we happen to have less, we'll be thankful and joyful and content because, Lord, our lives are anchored on who you are and what you've done and how you love us. I pray that for each person here, we would walk in the freedom and away from the bondage of coveting, the freedom of contentment and joy and thankfulness. Lord, longing for all you have for us, but not wanting what everybody else has. We pray that this one of the Ten Commandments would go deep in our souls and change the way we live our lives. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.